This is the fourth video in the Biology Key Skills video tutorial series. In this video, we will be looking over cell transport. In this video, we will look at what is meant by a concentration gradient. We will look at the processes of diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. And finally, we will look at how to calculate percentage change in the mass of a potato chip. Our big question today is to compare the processes of diffusion, osmosis and active transport. Before we can look at diffusion, osmosis and active transport, we need to be aware of what we mean by concentration. So concentration is how much of a chemical there is in a fixed volume. So if something is dilute of low concentration, it will have very few solute molecules within lots of solvent, in a strong or high concentration, this is the opposite. We have lots of solute in a lower volume of solvent. A concentration gradient is when we have a barrier between these two. So for example, in this one here, the one on the right is of higher concentration than that of the left. Therefore, the concentration gradient would go from high to low. So the concentration gradient would go that way. The first cell transport that we're going to look at is diffusion. Diffusion is the simplest of the cell transports, as it is the gradual movement of particles from a place of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So it naturally goes down the concentration gradient. So diffusion is the net movement, that's the overall movement, of particles from this area of high concentration to an area of low concentration down a concentration gradient. As this is a natural movement down a concentration gradient, it does not require energy. This means it is a passive process. Diffusion can happen in both liquids and gases. For example, if you were to spray a deodorant can on one side of the room, you would be able to smell it on the other side of the room after a few minutes. This is because they have diffused from that area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Within our body, we use diffusion a lot, as it allows us to move small molecules, such as glucose, amino acids, water and oxygen, across cell membranes into the cell. Our second type of cell transport is osmosis. Osmosis is effectively diffusion of water. So osmosis is the net movement of water molecules across a partially permeable membrane from a region of low solute concentration to a region of high solute concentration. It can also be seen as the movement of water from a region of higher water concentration to a region of lower water concentration. A partially permeable membrane is a membrane that lets certain molecules through it. For example, water. So it's a membrane that's got very, very small holes in it that can allow these small molecules through. But larger molecules, things like sucrose or red blood cells, aren't going to be able to travel through. For example, in this diagram, we have a much higher solute concentration on the right-hand side. As such, the net movement of water is going to be from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Water molecules are actually passing both ways because the water molecules are moving about randomly. However, the overall net flow, so the overall movement, would be from the left to the right because the water molecules are moving towards that higher solute concentration. This means the solute concentration gets more dilute on the right-hand side and less dilute on the left. Effectively, the water is trying to get the same concentration on both sides of the membrane. Once the concentration is the same on both sides, the movement of water will continue. However, there will be no overall net change. Therefore, this movement will be the same in both directions. The final type of cell transport we need to know is active transport. Active transport differs from diffusion and osmosis because it requires energy. This makes it an active process. 
The reason it requires energy is it's going against the concentration gradient. So active transport is the movement of particles across a membrane against the concentration gradient. So from an area of a lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. It does this by using the energy transferred during respiration. Active transport is very useful to our body. For example, it's used during digestion as well as during filtration of the blood. In filtration of the blood, all of the glucose gets moved out of the blood initially and then has to be moved back into the blood against its concentration gradient. This means that we need carrier proteins to carry the molecules across the concentration gradient. This uses energy. A useful way to remember this is to think of it in a real world situation. So if you had a boulder at the top of a hill and you wanted to get it down to the bottom of the hill, you'd be going down the concentration gradient from a high concentration to a low concentration. That would be very easy and wouldn't require energy. To move the boulder from the bottom to the top, so against its concentration gradient, would require a lot of energy, therefore would be active transport. I now want you to complete this table to show the differences between the different types of cell transport. So, for diffusion, it does not require energy. It does not require a carrier protein. It moves from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And an example would be oxygen diffusing from the alveoli into the blood. Once again, osmosis doesn't require energy. It doesn't require a carrier protein. And it goes from an area of high water concentration to low water concentration, or from low solute concentration to high solute concentration. And a good example would be water moving from the soil into a root hair cell. Finally, we have active transport, which does require energy. And it requires a carrier protein. It moves from a low to high concentration. And a good example is glucose moving back into the blood in the kidney. Of these three cell transports, you need to know a bit more about osmosis. All solutions can be labelled as being hypotonic, isotonic or hypertonic. If a solution is hypotonic, this means it has less solute in it than we find inside the cell. As such, in a hypertonic solution, water would move into the cell, causing the cell to expand. In an isotonic solution, the concentration of solute is the same inside and outside of the cell. This means that although water will move out of the cell, it will move into the cell at the same rate. There will be no net change in the amount of water in the cell, and so its size and its mass will stay the same. Finally, we have hypertonic solutions. In this case, there is a higher solute concentration outside of the cell than there is inside the cell. As such, the water molecules will move out of the cell in order to dissolve that solute, and as such, the cell will shrink and it will become smaller. There is also a core practical that you need to know for osmosis. This uses potatoes and sucrose solution. We can use potatoes and sucrose solution as potatoes themselves contain sucrose, so we can set up a concentration gradient. We start by preparing sucrose solutions of different concentrations, ranging from 0 molar concentration of sucrose, so that would be pure water, up to a very concentrated sucrose solution, for example, 1 molar. We then have our range, so for example, 0, 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and 1 molar. We then use a cork borer to cut out a thin slice of potato. We cut the ends off to get rid of the skin and then we cut them to the same size. This will make sure that our potato pieces are all of the same size to start with. We then use a mass balance to measure the starting mass of each tube of potato. We then put 
the potato into the sucrose concentration. So we would have one piece in the 0 molar, one in the 0 0.2, etc., etc. And we then leave them for about 30 minutes to 40 minutes. The reason we have to leave them is because this is a passive process, it will take time for osmosis to happen. Once the time has finished, we remove the potato tubes from the concentrations and we pat them dry with a paper towel just to remove any excess water. We then weigh each one again and we record its new mass. What we will find is that some of them have increased in mass, some of them have decreased in mass as per the example here. These results were taken from a similar experiment that instead of using sucrose concentrations used Ribena and water. As we can see, as the percentage of Ribena increases, the change overall in the mass goes down. So for example, in pure water, the potato gets 6.25% larger, or 0.12 grams. Whereas in the 100% Ribena, so a very concentrated sucrose solution, it decreased in mass by 18%, which was a change in minus 0.36 grams. We can also see at 15% Ribena used that the overall mass stayed the same. This would mean that at 15% the Ribena was acting as an isotonic solution. In order to work out the percentage change, we do the final mass minus the initial mass divided by the initial mass times 100. So we look at that change over the initial to work out our percentage change. In order to make sure that our results are accurate, it is important to ensure that the only thing we're changing each time is the concentration of the sucrose and that we repeat each experiment three times in order to get averages. Once we have calculated our change in mass, we can plot this on a graph in order to find out the isotonic point. The change in mass goes on the y-axis and the concentration of sucrose in moles per dm cubed or our percentage of Ribena used goes on the x-axis. This graph allows us to identify three areas. For example, this first area, which is above the x-axis, is where the potato is in a hypertonic solution. Water is entering into the potato and therefore the potato is getting larger. Where the line crosses the x-axis is the isotonic point. At this point, we have the same concentration of water, both inside and outside the potato, and as such, there is no change in mass. Finally, we have the area below the x-axis. This is the hypertonic region, where the water is moving out of the potato into the solution, and as such, the potato is losing water and its mass is getting smaller. So that finishes this video tutorial on cell transport. Today, we have looked at what is meant by concentration gradient. We've explained the processes of diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. And we've looked at how to calculate percentage change in the mass of a potato chip. So our big question today was to compare the processes of diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. I want you to have a go at that question now. Okay, so diffusion occurs when particles randomly move from a high to low concentration. This is a passive process that does not require energy. Osmosis is when water molecules move from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water, or from a low concentration of solute to a high concentration of solute. This happens across a semi-permeable membrane or a partially permeable membrane and is also a passive process that does not require energy. Active transport occurs when particles move from low to high concentration, so against their concentration gradient. And finally, active transport requires energy and a carrier protein.
That concludes this fourth video in the Biology Key Skills Revision Tutorial Series. In the next video, Tutorial Video 5, we will be looking over testing for biological molecules as well as the energy in food. That fifth video will only be applicable if you are doing the triple science option or the separate science option.